let's go ahead and get started. So welcome to this month's seminar uh, hosted by the California Botanical Society. Before, uh, I'm Amy Litt. I'm um, currently recording secretary of the society. I was president for a few years, but I have now um, gratefully handed that over to Kathleen Kay, who is also on this um, Zoom. Thank you, Kathleen. Um, and before I get started, uh, I do want to just share, before I introduce the speaker, I want to just share one quick announcement. Um, here we go. Um, okay, uh, does everyone see the poster? Somebody? Yep. Yeah, okay. So um, I apologize that we're very, very late in getting registration open for this. But we are having the California Botanical Society is having their annual banquet and mixer on April 13th at the Fullerton Arboretum. Um, the information is on our website, also calbotsoc.org. Um, and it will be, you'll be hearing about it imminently. Um, I'm very excited to say that our speaker will be Michael Simpson from San Diego State who probably many or most of you know, um, has a long career um, in systematics uh, and plant diversity, and we hope will tell us a lot of um, interesting uh, stories and, and tell us a lot of interesting things about what he's done. Um, so please uh, be alert for the registration um, coming, hopefully imminently. Let's see, what is this? Okay, um, it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Ingrid Jordan Thaden. Um, I'm not exactly sure how long I've known Ingrid, and I'm not exactly sure how I met her either. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> it's been a while. Um, uh, and so um, Ingrid um, is, uh, as she has said, is a native Nebraskan, and she received her bachelor's in two, bat two degrees in horticulture and chemistry, um, as well as her MS in biology from the University of Nebraska, uh, Lincoln. And then um, I'm not exactly sure what prompted this, but she went to Germany for her PhD, which she studied the systematics and biodiversity of Draba under Marcus Koch at the University of Heidelberg Institute for Plant Science. Then she did a couple of postdocs, first at the University of Florida with the solstices on Tragopogon. And then uh, at Bucknell, she was the David Burpee plant genetics postdoc with Chris Martin, um, studying genetics and systematics. And then she was a research botanist at the Jepson Herbarium and also lab manager um, working in ferns and lycophytes with Carl Rothfels. And then in 2017, she uh, was appointed the director of the Botanical Garden and Greenhouse at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, where she oversees a, a large living collection and gardens that are used for teaching, also open to the, at least the gardens are open to the public. And she also teaches there, she lectures in botany, and she continues her work on Draba, which she'll talk to us about. Um, and also, um, so she is interested in speciation and adaptation, and she's using phylogenetic and population genomic methods, but she's actually interested in much, much more than that. Um, and uh, I know um, that Ingrid, uh, so to tell you a little bit more about Ingrid, she um, pursues painting in her uh, some of her off time, particularly watercolors, um, and I'm going to share a picture that she posted recently on Facebook, so that makes it kind of fair game, of a whelk that she and her daughter saw um, in Florida, which as you can see, she was taken with beautiful colors of it. But she also said that um, the round and bubbly surface was hard to paint. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> um, appropriate for the day, she also likes to bake pie. So, in honor of Pi Day, let me turn the thing, the seminar over to Ingrid Jordan Thaden, who will talk to us about her work on Draba. Well, thank you very much for that really awesome introduction, um, Amy. And uh, I could tell you, I went to Germany just for fun. So <laughs> there's a lot more behind that, but that's basically why. Also, before um, you get so started, I'm gonna go ahead. I one more thing before you get started, yeah. if everyone could please mute themselves and stay muted. Okay, go for Thanks. it. Thanks. 
All right. Um, one thing I I was going to try to share uh, a document with everyone because it's kind of funny, um, but uh, I'll see if I can do that somehow. If I can set, share a file, but I'm not sure that the chat is letting me do that. Um, but we'll worry about that later. All right. So I'm going to share my screen. Okay. All right. So uh, let's see. Let me move this out of the way. Oh, yes, yeah, that's fine. Okay, well, um, I'm going to talk to you all about Drava, and I'm going to try to focus on North American Cordillera and Drava and try not to get too far apart from everything. Um, but I did want to kind of show you that, you know, I am currently the director of the Botany Garden and Greenhouse in the Botany Department in Madison. And we, our greenhouse is open to the public, um, and we are open Monday through Friday, eight to four. So we do have a lot of tours coming through and we have a lot of different plants to look at. Um, and of course, a lot to take care of. Um, but you know, that's also fun too, so to be able to take care of all those plants. Um, as, uh, as Amy mentioned, um, I did my PhD um, at the University of Heidelberg. And as many of you know, Dr. Isan Al-Shabazz, he's, he's at the Missouri Botanic Garden Emeritus. Um, so he was my co-advisor while I worked on um, Drava with Marcus Koch in Heidelberg um, and was funded by the DFG, the German for, uh, Research Associate Research Grant Program. Um, and I actually, Isan, this is a picture I just stole from uh, Jepson's Facebook page. Uh, he was just in in uh, at the UC herbarium last week, um, annotating various other um, brassicaceae working on a different group at the moment. Um, but I was lucky when I was doing my PhD to visit him in Mobot when he was working on re-describing um, all of brassicaceae in general, but focusing on drama. And he had almost all the loans in his collection there in the Missouri Botanic Garden. And this is just one of the uh, press uh, specimens that he had that I could look at with the largest drava and the smallest drava on the same sheet. Um, and I think that's quite fun to look at. Um, and then since then I've done uh, Tragopogon, which is the picture from the, uh, of, that was sent around, not a drava. Um, and then also worked on Australian Solanums with Chris Martin at Bucknell. Um, and then in the Rothfels lab when he was up UC, um, I helped him with uh, various fern phylogenomics and isoetes and so on. Um, but I've kept my drama going as this like background information, my whole um, career since I left my PhD um, and doing lots of field collections. And I've been working on standardizing population assessment methods and trying to teach people that me those methods. Um, and looking at population sizes of drabas, not just one species, but many different if I can, and what are associated species of different draba species. Um, Isan does all the major heavy lifting in the taxonomy, and I don't try to get in his way on that. Uh, we are, I am hoping to help him with his monograph on drama, so that's later. But as a horticulturalist, I do a lot of growing plants, and here I've got a couple of just examples of where I grow plants for reproductive mode screening, counting their chromosomes, uh, crossing, trying to um, test species boundaries, so real old school classic systematic studies. Um, and then spending quite a bit of time looking at different herbarium specimens, using herbarium data to help choose new fieldwork sites and trying to um, add leaf tissues to phylogenetics of, uh, of Draba and also other groups. Um, so right now, if you're in the Midwest, actually anywhere around the world, you're gonna see Draba verna flowering right about now. Um, it hasn't started here in Wisconsin, but just a little bit far south, it is already going. This is the, the tiny little baby um, Drava that Aldo Leopold wrote about. And I've been studying the systematics of this whole group in a lot of different ways. Um, but most of my Drava sites look more like this, um, which is, this is the, I think this is the White Mountains um, and where most Drava grows above the tree line. Um, so why am I studying Drava and why is it I keep studying Drava? I think it's interesting to study 
speciation if you have a lot of different species to work with personally. Um, so this genus has almost at least over 400 species um, and they have a really high genetic diversity just from those early days of studies of simple TRNLF and ITS. Um, many of the species have really narrow distributions, but there's still some with wider distributions, which is good to have a mix of the two. Um, they have all different ranges of ploidy levels, which makes things exciting and terrifying at the same time. Um, and that it's all really young, you know, within the past nine to five million years are where most of the migrations have happened, um, so happening during the Pleistocene. Um, so at the beginning of my PhD, if I go way back before getting too off track, um, the first person to really look at Drava was in uh, a, uh, Schultz in 1927. He was a German botanist. And my PhD, I worked to try and see if any of his classifications, as well as Tomachev from Russia, um, his class, their classifications were artificial or not. And yes, of course they are. Um, but Mulligan, um, who is a botanist in Canada, uh, who still is a botanist in Canada, he proposed that there were three major groups of Drava based on their chromosome numbers and petal color. And that was confirmed by molecular work in 2003 by Bilstein and Wyndham. So I'll talk about that. Um, and so when you're looking at what an entire gene is, trying to figure out where everything is, you have to just spend a lot of time looking at floras. So I looked at floras for days and days and days, ended up one of my papers from my PhD is basically describing all the distributions of all the different Drava species around the world and where the endemic ones are. So I have this, I call it my Drava opus, um, which kind of summarizes where all these species are and what ecoregions they're associated with, try to look beyond um, political boundaries and more into the um, floristic boundaries. Um, and in the end, I think, you know, all areas of Drava are really interesting, um, but being that I'm an American, I came back to America and focusing on American Drava after I finished my PhD. Um, but you'll, I'll show you that later my um, work indicated that there was a lot of Arctic influence in American Drava. Um, so I'm also interested in Arctic Drava, especially Beringian Drava, um, because of their influence on the lineages of North American Drava. Um, and so North American Drava is where I've been spending most of my time looking since about, uh, I guess, uh, my first field trip in North American Drava was in 2012. So the um, this is, if you're asking, what's the North American Cordillera? So this is the overview. It goes, you know, from the Brooks Range all the way down to the Sierra Madre and Sierra Occidental in New Mexico. Um, then there's also the South American Cordillera. And I think what's really interesting about Drava right away is that there are a few species that grow or that, that are found of Drava in very large swaths across the North American Cordillera. But in South America, there isn't. There are, there's more endemism in the South American Cordillera um, and uh, much more narrowly ranged species. So if you're not familiar with all of the mountain ranges of North American Cordillera, I highly recommend you spend some time on Google and find all the fun stuff about them. But um, I've most of the drama that I have been collecting has been in these ranges from uh, the interior of Alaska um, through the Yukon down the Rocky Mountains and in the Intermountain West. Um, but I have not been to the Mexican Highlands and there is really no substantial drama on the coastal ranges of the Pacific coastal ranges. So if you exclude talking about the Beringian drama, which is kind of a separate story, um, North American drama of the Cordilleran side is mainly made up of these uh, sort of shared groups of ecoregions that I lumped into North, Central, and Southern, um, with the central part of the Rocky Mountains being the most with 58 taxa, um, and also the central part of the Central being that there's 49 of those 58 there. Um, so as I wrote this paper in 2013, which was one of the chapters of my thesis as well, 
Um, it reads kind of crazy, and I, I'd love to share with you if, if you want to. The, the paper is not uh, publicly available, so I can email it to you if you want me to. So go ahead and send it to me, uh, your email, and I will send it to you directly. Um, but if you think about how one describes a very complicated distribution, um, it reads something like like this. There are, you know, two two of the three species, and just goes on and on. I'm just giving this an example of how complicated it was to describe the distribution of all of the North American uh, drava that there are, because many of them overlap with different ecoregions, um, and probably just as complicated as maybe uh, Potentilla, for example. Um, there's a lot of uh, shared space and endemism in the same place. And a lot of drama co-occur together in the same place. Um, so it makes things even more complicated when you're um, trying to identify them all. But uh, nonetheless, if you would like to read my drama opus and uh, which would eventually be put into the monograph, uh, I can send you a copy of that. Um, so this, these are the main regions which I've done most of my collections for Java, except not marked in here is the uh, the Nevada um, Humboldt Toyabi, and then also the Sierra Nevada. Okay, um, and then just to show you something other kind of crazy, uh, polyploidy in Java is really variable. Um, so Draba has uh, everything from diploid to um, actually doodecaploid, which is here, and oct it just or oct octodecaploid. Sorry. So it really ranges a lot, but there were some trends if you like try to compare them all. And um, one is that the further you go into the Arctic, the higher the ploidy level you would find. And this is just species trends that I found from looking at the literature um, and about 50% of the genus has been counted in their chromosome counts. Um, and that publication, you can read uh, more about that in uh, Jordan, Thaden and Koch in 2008. So, and then as far as understanding the um, phylogeny of Draba, uh, it was all based on herbarium tissue sampling as one does in this time of day. So I published this in 2010, and a lot of this data was obtained from about 2005 to 2008 um, at various herbaria. Um, I wasn't the only one who collected samples for this project, so there were other people who helped with this project. Um, but it came out with a nice, you know, good, strong backbone that we all like to see and helped understand um, the classifications before were um, definitely. Um, artificial and not not true. Um, and then it also renamed some of these annual drabas uh, into Tomostoma and Abdra, which were actually section names, um, and renamed Draba Morales, which is a, um, a different type of Draba in the Mediterranean, and um, also renamed a Draba Hystrix into Erebus. Um, and then this also correlated with Mulligan's hypotheses of the yellow petals, and the chromosome number variations versus the white petals with base chromosome number of feet. And that's not, everything is in like perfect, but it's pretty close. But after I um, finished the phylogeny, I noticed a couple of taxa that were doing something quite fun. Um, some people would run away from a taxa like this, but I thought it was pretty exciting. And I know I, you've probably heard me say this before if you've heard my talk, um, but oligosperma was the one that stand out as an interesting taxa because it showed up in my two main separate clades here. Um, and it is unique because uh, Mulligan also showed that it was an apomict based on his observations of pollen in the 70s. And so if it was supposed to be an apomic, why does it have this uh, genetic variability that's showing up all over the tree? Um, so obviously I would say that must be a hybrid origin, of course, and something fun to spend my time doing. Um, and luckily, uh, Michael Windham gave me some pointers on what to do. And so um, I'm still using notes that I got from Michael Windham in 2009 about the study from isozyme data. Um, and uh, as also when you're working on simple 
ITS and TRNLF data, you try to do a phylogeographic study, came up with these sort of main regions with shared haplotypes, um, but the story was really complicated and it looked something crazy like this. Uh, so with all kinds of connections and singlets and you know the network analysis was all over the place. And I probably would have been better off uh, actually trying to just make a guess. Um, but in the end, I was able to just kind of say some things about migration and where, where different species might have um, migrated or lineages, excuse me, have migrated. And that there was based on the phylogeny, there was some early migration happening. Um, and then potentially during the last glacial maximum, you had some various vicariance events. And then post glacial LGM, you had lineages spreading out again, and then suture zones between old and new lineages. So this data is based on uh, genetic diversity and haplotype diversity of TRNLF, just one gene region. And it was able to help me confirm that the Center for Genetic Diversity was somewhere over here in what's called Irenica, um, while the Center for Species Diversity was over here in the Rocky Mountains. So uh, we then say, well, this is definitely an area of highly active speciation because of um, the number of species there and also because of the number of unusual chromosome numbers that are found in that area. Um, so as I um, moved back to the United States, I tried to figure out what I would do next. And of course, growing oligosperma was, or collecting oligosperma was on the docket. Um, so oligosperma, remember, was found here in my North American clade and also, um, and my South American clade and then in the Asian Beringian Arctic clade. Um, and then another taxa of interest that I thought would be a good outgroup for this study was this really well-behaved diploid drop of Ramosissima that's in the Appalachian Mountains, thinking that it could help uh, tie me together with the rest of the uh, Cordilleran species. And also Ramosissima is quite interesting and in that it's in, share, in a shared clade with Siberian drava. So if you had a lineage that looked like this big purple or big red uh, circle here, um, and the glaciers broke it up and left those lineages separated. And then maybe the glacier came back during the, during the glaciation cycles, it broke it up again and so on. And then you're left with this broken group of lineages and where you would have connections of the Appalachian species with Siberian species potentially, and also with the Cordillera species. So I've been working on that aspect ever since. Um, and my, I just have to show this picture because I think it's fun. This was my first drama that I ever found in the wild and this was in Slovakia during my PhD. We went to the Slovakia Carpathians and this is this cute little drama Azoides, which is one of the most common European dravas. Um, but then when I got to North America, I, my, this was my first North American drava species, drava densifolia from Snowbird. And this was my second, which was as a super endemic area only from the Santa Quins Mountains. So really tiny little place named by Winton himself. And then let's see. Um, I guess I just wanna show you that I was kind of nuts and I grew a whole bunch of drama while I was in Germany from seed banks. So this was my greenhouse full of drava. I had a, over 600 plants and uh, I did mating uh, testing experiments with them to determine whether they were um, sexual, uh, whether they were self incompatible and so on. So that was um, something I did in while I was playing with DNA. So this kept me sane. And in uh, this is where I confirmed that oligosperma from North America had apomictic um, seed because the pollen would not develop. So that's a fun story. Um, and then something else they're really weird, this Java nemorosa, which could be a, a model species if I was to get into that kind of thing, um, can grow from seed to seed 
in like four weeks top with uh, all kinds of other cool things about it. Um, but in the end, what was really fun about this experiment was uh, the set of experiments as I was able to kind of show um, some species of dravos were self-compatible. Um, some were also not only self-compatible, but self-flowering or self-pollinating, excuse me. So they would actually pollinate themselves without any assistance of my hand. Um, and in fact, I found almost every type of mating system in Drava in this experiment. I found self-compatible, self-incompatible, self-fertilizing, insect-dependent, and apomictic, which is kind of crazy for one genus to have all those different breeding mechanisms in them. And I did find some trends with that, and that one of the trends was that the polyploids or diploids are more likely to be self-incompatible and they were more not able to self-fertilize as easily, while the polyploids were most likely to be self-compatible and able to self-fertilize really easily, um, which is something that the Norwegian botanists have figured out has happened with Drabo, where you have a lot of cryptic species happening because of this intense amount of self-fertilization. Um, so that's all fun and dandy. But back to the North American side, um, as I'm studying this apomictic drama, I'm thinking, oh my goodness, what am I going, get, what am I getting myself into? Who wants to study apomictic plants? Um, they're all going to be uh, the same. It's going to be one giant clone. There's going to be, you know, you're going to come out here and you're just going to see this big, all genetic. They're all similar to each other. Um, or is it possible that apomixis actually gives them an ecological advantage potentially? Um, so over the uh, five years of collections, I went um, the Sierra Nevada to all the way to the Laramie Plains and up to the um, Yukon. So this is the distribution of Drava oligosperma. You can see that it also does occur in Colorado, but I didn't obtain Drava and oligosperma in Colorado before this study was over. Um, so I targeted all the national forests I could get my hands on and started collecting oligosperma in all its beautiful glory. And this is it in about the size of a quarter down here with these other little miniature plants. And going into the big horns as well, I started to recognize that oligosperma liked these really big open areas, these big plateaus, um, and uh, other big saddles and swaths compared to other dravas that I would come across that preferred to hide in the rocks. Um, so then also the Shoshone. Uh, this was the first time I went to the Beartooth, which I'll explain. It's a really cool place that I will continue going back to for a while now. Um, and uh, various places in the Gallatin National Forest, I went all over there. Um, and this was one of my favorite sites that I went to where uh, the drava was just the oligosperma was all along the swath. But as soon as the, the, um, the, sorry, I'm forgetting my words. I've been teaching today and my brain is a little bit tired. Um, the slope, as soon as the slope was a little bit too steep right here, the oligosperma would go away. And then there were probably other, many other dravas up here. Um, but in general, oligosperma grows in this sort of hard pan um, with granitic, not really limestone rock, crack, rock, crack, crushed rip rock. Um, and sometimes, very rarely, I also find it with sagebrush um, in this particular type of forest here. Um, but usually it's with the little, um, the little Artemisia frigida, not necessarily the tridentata or nova. Um, and then in the Sierra Nevada, uh, there's lots of places where it was collected uh, by um, Peter Raven and Jepson. Um, and so I kind of followed some of their herbarium labels to get to some cool places. So here I got to see some of the other associated drava with, with drava oligosperma. And this is La uh, Longus guamosa in the Mono Pass. Um, but it actually likes to be down here in what's high, I would call the wet feet area or the snow melt area. And this is not the same spot of where oligosperma preferred, which would be up here instead. 
um, where it's high and windy and dry. Right, so this is very typical. This is the largest oligosperma collection I found was the Sheep, Mount, the sheep Mountains um, in the White Mountains. I would estimate that oligosperma covers almost every square inch of the White Mountains. There were tens of thousands of species growing around that area. Um, right underneath the bristlecone pine, the patriarch, you've got um, oligosperma all in the pine needles everywhere. Um, so it would be all over here. And on the Dana Plateau, you, this was kind of an unusual kind of site where we had the um, Krimholtz sort of um, pine tree effect and then uh, drop oligosperma growing in these rocks. And I would always find the associated drabas the, that I would walk past, or maybe they were nearby the oligosperma. And this was their usual habitat, where it's like a slope with lots of rock. Um, and maybe there's a plant sort of holding on for dear life so it doesn't fall down the hill. Um, and this is Asterophora, which is a uh, threatened species at the Lake Tahoe Drava. Um, and I would guess one really good reason why this is threatened is because people like to jump around on these rocky things all the time, especially if it's right next to the trail. Um, but then as soon as the wind picked up, this is my travel partner of this field trip. This is Tommy Stoughton. As soon as the wind would pick up, I'd be like, oh, I think we're gonna see oligosperma. It's gonna be around the corner because the wind is strong and that's what oligosperma preferred. Um, so here in Mount Rose, we had um, oligosperma growing and then there were quite a few other little drabas as well in that area. So sometimes I see a fuchsia here, that's a really short draba, this one right here in the middle, really condensed. And here, this one's a little bit bigger. Um, you can't really tell from that picture, but um, I thought for sure that was a genetic difference, um, but I can tell you later that it was not. All right, the Humboldt Tayabi, probably one of the most favorite places I've ever been. This is, that includes all of these different uh, north-south facing mountain ranges, including the rubies. Um, look like this. If you've never been there, you should go. It's really beautiful. Um, unless you like trees, then you shouldn't go because there aren't any trees. <laughs> well, there are aspens down in the valleys if you want to go see some aspens. Um, uh, I'm going to start digressing with fun stories, but I will, I'll stay focused. Um, here's, uh, yeah, just some more pictures of fun of oligosperma. This is Java steroides um, in the Ruby Mountains, and it is the most adorable Java I, I think it's one of the cutest ones I ever saw, and partially because it's growing literally outside of the rock. Like it's, it's rooted in the rock, like directly. So that's, you know, plants. Uh, Java pedicillata in the Ruby Mountains was also pretty frequent. Um, and you could see it preferred these rock crevices where, you know, soil would gather in the crevice and kind of hide on the sides. Um, and then, of course, all over Montana, because that's where the Continental Divide runs through the most, and I would spend most of my time trying to find places near the Continental Divide. Um, and then, of course, I am not only looking at Drava. I look at all mustards equally, so um, whenever I see a Smilwaskia, I try to collect that as well, as well as all other Erebus, and if I'm crazy, I collect more than one Erebus, or excuse me, Bukhara. Um, here's a site in uh, the Little Belt Mountains where it's sprinkled mostly here with, uh, um, oh, what is that? That's Pedicularis, I believe, um, and little itty bitty Tomostoma platycarpa, which is the annual drava that we renamed and Oligosperma growing together. Oh, no, that's Castilea, excuse me, that's a yellow Castilea. Um, this is something that someone um, asked me about, and I've said I've seen it many times. You can see here where the stalks of these fruiting pedicels are turning black, and it's definitely a fungi that's attacking the stalks. Um, but I don't seem to think that it was causing any problems. All of these stalks still had a lot of seed. Um, and here's one developing quite nicely, um, just sitting here nestled with in the rocks. 
This is a Tomostoma platycarpa with um, really long salix, looking like you know, a typical mustard. Uh, the common name for oligosperma is few seeded draba. I have a picture of what of one that has only one seed and it looks so funny actually. All right, there's more drabocytes. There's the more tiny drabas. They tend to look really similar to a lot of other alpine plants. And so it's kind of hard to tell them apart unless you touch them. And the drava has a different texture than some of the other small plants um, nearby. Oops, sorry. Um, another way to tell that I've seen drava is if I'm walking across an area and I see patches of rock where the grass is not growing. Um, so from a distance, you can actually see these sort of grassy patches and in those grassy patches, or sorry, the broken up grassy patches, that's where you'll probably find Rabo oligosperma. Um, so if you look here in the red conglomerates in Idaho, wherever there was sort of a dry patch, like a sandy patch, that's where I would find oligosperma, or it's a rocky patch, not sandy. Um, so I can imagine that the red conglomerates are literally covered with millions of, of, of uh, individuals. Um, this was also one of my largest populations that I found that just continued all the way down this valley. It was almost continuous growing with um, Artemisia nova, I believe that's what that is. And then I went up to Yukon. Um, Drava grows only, um, Drava oligosperma only grows to southern Yukon. Um, but I was also going up there with uh, my collaborator, Tommy Stoughton, who works on Claytonia. Many of you know, to know Tommy. And um, we went up here to Tombstone Territorial Park to collect uh, um, Claytonia as well. And then Kino Hill and a couple other places to get more Claytonia. Um, and then we collected Draba in Kluani and around the Whitehorse area. Um, and this was also where I went to a great place called the Beringian Interpretive Center in Whitehorse. Um, if you're ever there, you should go. Um, and then my collaborator on all things Drava and Mustard, Bruce Bennett, he is a retired um, botanist in Yukon um, with his own herbarium in his home. And you're, um, if you have any interest in looking at Yukon plants, you should go to the baby herbarium, the Bruce A. Bennett of Yukon Herbarium. Um, and here he named uh, Draba, um, the Yukon Draba here in the Yukon Flats. And also with the Yukon Draba, there's also um, Oligosperma, of course. Um, we also collected Draba palindriana in the Kings in Kluani. Looking really cute and with lots and lots of seed. Um, and then this is the trip to uh, the, um, Alber uh, the Alberta uh, Rocky Mountains or the Northern Rockies. Um, and we went, my, I took my father on this trip and we went to the Northern part in Jasper and then Banff and then also in the Waterton area. So up in the Northern part in the Jasper, we found all kinds of different drabas up there and we didn't have a whole lot of time. So we were on Whistler's Peak, unfortunately. It was really, um, even though it was with a lot of trampling, um, there were still quite a few species, some of which I can't key out. They just don't, they don't key out without having flowers. So I'd have to go back, um, but they are, unidentified to me dravas because I would need to go back there multiple times in a year for this particular ones. Um, here's Cory Pass in Banff where we hunted uh, drava juvenilis and we found it. Look how cute it is. Um, this is down in the southern part of Alberta um, on the way to Waterton where it's sort of a high plateau grassland area that's Kind of, I would say, similar to the Laramie Plains, but a little bit taller. I believe it's up into the 10,000 feet um, altitude. Um, and uh, there is quite a lot of oligosperma all over these rocks, but only oligosperma. I didn't find any other dravas in the high plains. There are other dravas, I just didn't find them, probably because I just wasn't there early enough in the year. 
Oops. All right, so most Jabos, they prefer this sort of um, wet zone uh, that's right, right above the tree line with, uh, with the rocks, um, kind of following the snow, the snow line, um, hiding behind uh, little sheltered areas. Um, but oligosperma and also a couple of other species like densifolia and a few other little tiny ones, um, these and the annuals, they tend to prefer some of these really large saddles and plateaus with high wind and high um, snowpack and a little bit more, like a lot of more exposure. I would say um, really deep snowpack, for example, um, and also just drier, just more desert-like habitat. Um, and also, if you were wondering, I did look to see if there was a genetic difference between this cushion form um, that you would normally see for alpine plants and this sort of crushed up compact form where they look really, really tight. And this seems to be just, uh, it's not genetic difference at all. Um, but I did find that there was a genetic difference on some trichome variation on the leaves, uh, but it's not a huge difference. Um, they're not separating them by species, but they are kind of slightly different in their genotypes. So these are undergrads that I made look for whether there were ciliate hairs on the leaves under a microscope before they dissected them because I was being mean. Just kidding. Um, and also because of the potential for sexual, sexual seed production that was predicted by Mulligan saying that he he had seen um, he had seen actual pollen that looked viable on herbarium specimens from somewhere in Wyoming and Montana. Um, I also collected any seed I could throughout those years, and we did a flow cytometry seed screen to check and see whether those seeds were produced via sex or by apomixis. Um, I can tell you more about that at another time. It's kind of hard to explain the whole process. Um, but the results were that about three and a half percent of the time, uh, and not not in one particular area, um, oligosperma would start producing sexual seed rather than asexual seed. So it seemed like that little bit of sexual uh, behavior allowed for some uh, gene flow. And you're asking, well, how much gene flow? Well, I can tell you, there's a lot of gene flow. Um, so as, uh, without going too far into the details, because um, I don't want to lose people who don't do a lot of molecular work, um, I uh, focused on trying to find a, a molecular method that could give me good population level sampling um, that was sensitive enough, but then didn't need to have like a whole genome sequence to compare it to or anything like that. So I chose the DDRAD or sort of GBS, whatever it's called, you want to call it the same thing. It's just using a restriction enzymes to cut up the DNA into tiny little pieces. And then you just sequence um, whatever pieces come out of it in a certain size range. Um, and in the end, I was able to get some really, really uh, helpful data um, that gave me, I don't know what I would say, high quality re resolution of the tree. Um, and ultimately the tree looks like this. So the tree is this big uh, 600, almost 700 individuals, 35 populations from all those. And it came up with these nice three big clades. The backbone is resolved. The different regions showed up together, which is really great. But I didn't understand why there were two large clades except for the possibility of them being um, one is a, uh, except for the possibility of a um, allopolyploid and then clade C, which didn't make sense to me at all. And then also to make things more complicated, other Drava species squirted themselves into the middle of these two clades. So if we look at those clades on the map, because this is more fun to look at the map, um, you can see here that clade A, which I've labeled here in blue, um, its distribution is pretty much, you know, from the whole distribution of oligosperma. And clades B here is kind of more Southern, right? 
And then clade C seems to be connected between these two areas, which just still didn't, at the time, didn't make any sense. So we have these overlapping clades geographically, but I was still trying to figure out what in the world is going on. Um, and then when you look at the structure analysis, now this is gonna be kind of a crazy slide here. All these different colors come up with uh, genetic genotype groups. Okay? So the data came out to eight different groups showing that you had enough genetic variation to create these eight groups. And then this, these lines that I drew between these different colored boxes are related, are, are what I interpret from the phylo, interpreted from the phylogenetic tree. So these will be connected because of their connection in the phylogeny. So you can see not only do we have a lot of genotypes, so there's a lot of genetic diversity, but there's also quite a bit of migration going on between the two, between the different populations across entire like ecoregions. But what came to be the most fascinating thing is right here, um, this particular area, which is the Gallatin National Forest and Beartooth Plateau, they had this really hyper diverse genotype in a spot. And I didn't understand what that meant for a while. Um, but, you know, something happened. It was called the pandemic. And we all sat around in our houses looking for things to do. And because I, um, uh, I keep everything. I'm kind of a hoarder when it comes to things. And I looked through all of my old uh, sample bags with different parts of the plants. And I found that in this particular area, um, everything just happens to be also in clade C and uh, not everything, but the things that were in clade C had a different type of trichome on the outside of the, um, the, um, the fruit valve, excuse me, after so much talking, I'm forgetting what I'm saying, the outside of the fruit valve. And turns out that clade C is actually different. Uh, they all have this different trichome on the fruit valve. And so I'm thinking potentially that I collected another species and that's what clade C is. So from 2001, 2003 and 2000, um, no, I think I just went 2001, 2003. I went back to the Beartooth Plateau where this um, this clade C and um, other oligosperma were kind of growing together. This is a picture of my dad this last summer. And we mapped out um, this population and tried to find the different types of trichomes and mark them. Here's the picture I have of the one drava with a few seeded drava with literally one seed on each valve. I think that's just the cutest darn thing I've ever seen. Um, and then following Michael Windham's rep, uh, recommendation, I went down south to, not too far south, to the south uh, west corner of Wyoming in Sweetwater County, and then also just right over the border there in, in Utah um, and collected samples there, um, which uh, Isan had renamed this it was Juni Draba juniperiana, and he renamed it to oligosperma given that it has so many similarities in the trichomes of the leaves and the flowers look the same and so on. Um, but uh, I'm now growing them in the greenhouse now and they are completely different in their uh, reproductive mode. They, um, they are, I think, potentially self-incompatible um, because they are not uh, crossing and I'm not able to cross them with themselves from one seed packet, for example. Um, so I do think I'm probably going to resurrect this theme to Draba juniperiana and that it might be more of endemic to this uh, uh, juniper and then a little bit into the pinion scrub. Um, but it, as of course, I am potentially going by what Wyndham said, that juniperiana could be the one of the parents of oligosperma, and that oligosperma is potentially an allopolyploid. So what that means, and then I'll wrap up here in just a second, um, what that means is that these two uh, parents share all of their chromosomes um, in a child or in a hybrid. And so you end up with an entire copy from one parent and an entire copy from the other parent instead of just half. So I'm now in the process of 
growing out these two parents that uh, Michael su suspected were parents of oligosperma. And I'm going to be counting their chromosomes um, and comparing them to my chromosome counts of oligosperma. So these are chromosome counts of oligosperma. I don't know if you've ever seen these kind of spread before. Um, this is just a stain that stains the DNA. So you can look through the microscope and see the, the chromosomes when they're in the condensed phase. Um, so I'm doing that with the potential parents. So that's exciting. Um, and then I thought I'd also, so that's kind of like the end of the illegal former story at the moment. It's kind of like an update of that. Um, but I thought I'd also, because some of you know that I went to Alaska and I have some fun, a few fun pictures from Alaska. Um, and then I'll end there after that. Um, so in the summer of 2022, I took a group of students with, uh, from the University of Wisconsin um, with a uh, endowment grant here in Wisconsin to do field work with students. And we went and collected population level sampling along the Dalton Highway. And then we went to the Seward Peninsula, which was a dream come true. And I focused on these areas because these are areas, except for this one right here, um, which are were unglaciated during the land form of Beringia, which is this big uh, brown outline here on this example drawn up here. Anyway, I can explain more about that later, but this was the fun trip that we took. Um, and my reason for going there really has to do with the fact that Beringia has already been shown to being a refuge for plants of the Arctic. Um, there's been a number of studies done um, that show that lineages of plants kind of hung out in, this, in the continent of Beringia during the ice ages. Um, but there isn't any good data yet to show that their uh, Beringia served as a refuge for lineages for North American plants as well. So I'm in the middle of working on this large project that's gonna take multiple years um, where we're gonna go and collect places that are ungla were unglaciated or near glacier areas, and then also places that were glaciated and compare the population genetics between the two. Um, so the students, uh, we were all together, we were 25 people and we had a fantastic time learning about the Alaskan interior and seeing some really amazing sites and very, very healthy populations of plants um, where we collected a lot of leaves, um, none of which has been processed yet uh, in the lab um, and then assessed population diversity, associated species, um, population size, and we looked at a number of different taxa, not just Java. Um, in fact, we also looked at Claytonia quite a bit. So this is me with Claytonia sarmentosa in the Brooks range. Um, and then here's me collecting Claytonia tuberosa on the Seward Peninsula, um, where you, I dug through and found a little tuber. Um, and then Claytonia acutifolia um, also on the Seward Peninsula. And then we also, this, oh, this was a picture of a Draba, which I can't key out. It doesn't come out to the key. Maybe it's Draba alpina, which is um, the, the catch-all for Arctic Draba. Um, but this was what was growing up at the Attigan Pass of the Brooks Range. Um, and then the one that we collected uh, for on a more hard pan type of area was Draba stenopedala in the Seward Peninsula. And we found that in a couple of sites. But we also collected calmia, procumbens, um, ledum, and it's at the population levels, um, and also impetrum, more calmia, and a couple of potentilla. We did potentilla by flora and uh, potentilla nivea. So, um, yeah, I guess uh, I'm obviously going to keep on working on all of these things. I have some new um, new trees and new drama data that I'm working with uh, that I will be using for the next who knows how long um, and planning some more population level sampling of those different 
places that are of interest. Um, and yeah, so just keep on growing them and see what will happen, I guess. Uh, I wanted to briefly thank um, the Native peoples of the Alaskan interior who helped us so much on our trip uh, and the people that worked there. Um, and then all of the North American um, ancestors and uh, allowing them, allowing us to learn on their ancestral lands. And then of course, acknowledging all these people and funding sources um, as well as uh, my family. And I guess I think, you know, I, that's it. Oh, and then here, uh, I also want to thank Bruce Bennett. He's been a huge help in this project um, over the years. Um, great. <laughs> <Are you? laughs> thanks, thanks, Ingrid. Uh, do you want to do you want to stop sharing your screen for a sec? Yes. Yeah. And uh, if anybody has any questions, we have a, a couple of minutes. But it, you know, I know Ingrid is super tired, but. Um, if she can stay on for a couple of minutes later, then um, you know we could have time for a few more questions. If anybody has any questions, as I'm fading into the into the um, <laughs> yeah, please go ahead and um, just uh, I think you have to um, unmute yourself there. I, I think. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I uh, that was an awful lot of interesting information to assimilate uh, at once. But uh, I was curious with the Ligosperma being in more than one clade, is it held together as one species because of morphology? Yeah, so um, Eson has held it together as, uh, as its own species. Sorry, I, I kind of broke up there. Am I back? Yeah. Sorry about that. I, I, I clicked something in my computer hookup. Um, Isan puts them in one species based on uh, all of the morphological characters, which he has measured for the specimens that he's looked at. Mm -hmm. um, and as right now, I could probably say that most of what he has identified as oligosperma or pushed back into oligosperma is going to hold, um, except this Junipriana, I think, is something is something separate. Um, but yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I I had the um, sorry I I had the uh, chat set um incorrectly, so there's a bunch of messages that unfortunately came directly to me. Um, first oh, of all, okay. Amelia, Amelia, Amelia Del Porto says thank you. Um, Tim Messick wants to know, were the two species of Cusichiella, Cusichiella, formerly Draba, included in your research? Cusichiella, um, they, they were not because uh, my advisor had already, uh, they're in a different tribe now. They're outside of Aribidae. So they, uh, he had the uh, Cusichiella, I think, is a separate. Um, it's actually outside of the Ribidae now, and so they, he had already pushed it out of Java that way. So they were not in my study. Okay, great. Um, I, I should say, by the way, that I, I reset the chat, so I think um, people should be able to post to everybody. Um, and then Amasi um, Coda Verdi, excuse me for butchering your name, says, "Great talk." I'm curious if you have any insights on how geography may correlate with the mating system. There's a second question. Do you have any idea about the relationship between latitude and ploidy levels? So first we'll go with how geography may correlate with mating system. Yeah, actually, um, I well, I know we definitely did see the diploids and polyploids had different mating systems. Um, and there just, there's also a, the fact that there are more diploids of Drava in Europe and Iran and Iranica area um, than there are in uh, North America. Mm. So you could, you know, I don't know if this necessarily means they're, you know, one precedes the other, but yeah. And then the second question was The second question is Do you have any idea about the relationship between? Uh, uh, the relationship between latitude and ploidy levels. 
yeah, so um, it the in the studies that I was able to put together with the, the literature of ploidy levels of Drava, there were more annuaploid and polyploid species the further up you went in altitude or in latitude. Um, and in the Arctic, you had the highest amount of poly of ploidy levels, like in the octodecaploid and so on. Interesting. Mm -hmm. um, Mike Basie says this was great. Thanks so much. So, but I think people should be able to um, chat with everybody now. Uh, any other questions? You can also just unmute yourself if you prefer. This is Lorraine Yates from Colorado, and I'm asking if you plan to come to Colorado to collect. It turns out uh, we've been calling <coughs> Draba oligosperma variety juniperiana, which has found in Dinosaur National Park. And I'm wondering if that's a possibility that it would be the same as the Sweetwater Wyoming species. I would, yeah, I would love to come to that because uh, um, it, you know, that opens up a whole, the fact that the Draba oligosperma variety of Juniperiana has been used as a variety name uh, maybe longer than Draba, Virgin, than Draba Juniperiana was. Um, so there are a lot of different cool places um, that we could go to see if that uh, potentially could be the same Draba Junipriana. Yeah, I'm really yeah. curious since you brought that up and it would be worth a, a trip here at some point to check it out. Yeah, and I would love to be able to see besides the floral architecture, um, which I can see in the greenhouse right now is very different. So it has gynostyle, which means it puts up the female before um, before the anthers are ready, the Junipria, Draba Junipriana does. Um, and oligosperma never has gynostyle. It always, um, uh, even when it is sexual, it has what's called what I call the uh, pollen dropping on the stigma head version, whatever that is uh, called right now, where it's literally it's like the anther and stigma are receptive immediately at the same time. So even though oligosperma most of the time is apomictic when it is sexual, the flower architecture is exactly the same. Um, and Juniperiana definitely has uh, what I would call classic mustard flower with the stigma sticking up and then the anthers down here, right? Okay. So you could maybe see that uh, growing this spring um, at the Dinosaur National Monument. Right, we have some collections at the Denver Botanic Gardens, uh, Catherine Kalmbach Herbarium, which are available on sign out with images. So you might want to take a look at those, and see if you can tell anything from the images. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah. Thank you very much. That was really an excellent presentation. Well, thank you. Thank you. We have, um, um, so, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry, I was just reading. Uh, oh yeah, okay. I was going to read it to you, but you can read. Do you anticipate I can read discovering it, um, new Java species in your travels? Oh, probably. It's a matter of whether I can describe them. <laughs> but yeah, uh, often, uh, so I actually found a new Drava species at Bruce Bennett's herbarium, in his herbarium, um, and then he named it uh, after Isan. Other questions, comments, thoughts? Applause. <laughs> I also have to say thank you to Alexa. Um, Alexa was my co-conspirator on the Alaska trip. Excellent. Well, co-conspirator read um, TA, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'll, we can hang out here for another minute, but I kind of feel like we should let Ingrid get to bed. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, any other um, any other questions, comments? Uh, well, here, why don't I, I can give you, um, I'm going to share a link really quick in the Zoom. Uh, I wrote a story about the um, trip to 
to uh, Alaska. And um, you can read about it and see more pictures uh, about Alaska and read like the whole process that we did. And I will put that link here in the, in the, just a second. How fast can I find the link? Just <laughs> and it also has a link toward to our INAT website um, for the trip. Okay. So here I'm giving it. Yep. So if you click, this is the website here. Oh. Um, and there's two buttons on there, the Beringian story, story of our excursion, and the iNaturalist project for the Beringian plants. So you can read about them there. Excellent. And see all the cool you, pictures. You can actually, you can find that website just by Googling you, it turns out. <laughs> uh, okay, yeah. Uh, but yeah, the, this, this particular page goes towards the, the Beringian story. Okay. So you can read that. All right, um, any other questions or comments? Well, thanks for everyone who came. <laughs> getting getting some getting some love from some uh, nice thank yous. <laughs> All right. Well, um, there's still an awful lot of people hanging on here, but um, yeah, I think I think we can let Ingrid Ingrid go and uh, yeah. Um, All right. Bye bye. I'm All just right. hanging well, on in you. case. I'm just hanging on in case anybody else puts any more any more comments in the chat. So I usually yeah, wait until the bloody true. end, but you're I can send it to you. So you're welcome to to leave. If oh, you, I can if stay you, around for a couple more minutes. Is I, think, gonna, I think I think people are, I think people are getting the hint. I think they're getting the hint. <laughs> so, okay, and they going home. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're down. We're down to down to a oh, few, man. and probably probably some of them, you know, have gone to the bathroom or, you know, whatever. There, there are frequently well, one, or two, one or two people left at the end who just don't seem to be present in any, in any capacity. So, uh, parents, did, you want, a, to, did okay. you want to say something? Good job, Ingrid. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thanks for hosting her too. My pleasure. My pleasure. Yeah, thanks for the invite. And then go to, yeah, go, go to bed. Go to bed. Yeah, we'll, we'll see yes. you in Grand Rapids, I'm, I hope. It's actually um, yeah, not we'll that it's not that late here. It's just that I'm in my office and it's dark outside. And the only light I have is overhead behind me. So that actually just makes it worse. So <laughs> all right. Okay. All right. I'm gonna I'm gonna shut it down, people. All right. Thank you. Okay. Take care. All right. Bye. -bye. Bye.